This video is sponsored by ACMA. So this is a project that really came about because my apartment is really getting too small for the types of projects that we do on our channel. So it came down to the solution of building my way out of the situation. So making ultra compact high density setups, which save a little bit of space. So this is episode two in the mini fabrication that's at the build series. If you haven't seen episode one, we 3D scan all the components that I want to put in this thing and talk about some future plans I have for it. So it's a little bit of a strange setup where we have sit stand legs implemented that actually lift the entire top up so we can put some machines up there as well uh, but when it's all dropped down it's compact enough to actually be shoved into a hallway without hitting the top of a doorway in this episode i'm focusing on the main body itself and we'll be using a gigantic laser cutter that acma has sent over this is the acma x1 they're bringing this out really quite soon you can check out the kickstarter i'll leave that in the description down below and i'll go over what i like what i don't like stress test it see how it performs this is a pre-production model, so most of the issues that I ran into with this pre-production model, they already mentioned beforehand, and they are fixing those for the full production model. So on the control box here, we have a switch that goes from laser to CNC mode. They did send me a CNC module, I haven't tested it out yet. That's pretty satisfying little click. So for the first cut, we'll be focusing on this side box over here. This actually holds the two main floors in place, I'm gonna call them. So the first thing we'll be laser cutting on the ECMA X1 is the side plate. There's a fair few things that make the Acma X1 really suitable for a project like this. And the first one being is its laser head. This is a 120 watt module. If you're not familiar with laser cutters for a diode laser, that's absolutely insane. So I'm using Lightburn to control the X1 over here, but Acma also offers its own proprietary software. And that allows for a lot of really interesting features like curved surface engraving. So if you have a board that is a little bit warped, it can compensate for the height up to 10 millimeters. So it took me a little while to actually figure out the most optimal settings for this machine. And in this case, I'm using 350 millimeters per minute at 100% power in a single pass. And it's cutting through 12 millimeter thick multiplex. You can see that the bottom is a little bit charred because we're using way too slow of a cutting speed here. So next up is this top plate, and this one is quite important that the gap in there is big enough to actually allow the entire flexible legs to drop into place. And we'll be fixing this with a 3D printed insert, so we have some adjustability as well. And for the second cut, I went up to 450 millimeters per minute at 100% power, still a single pass. And that seemed to work out really quite nicely. There was still a little bit of charring underneath there. So for the next cut, the same piece essentially, I went up to 500 millimeters per minute. That is quite frankly insane. It was able to just about cut through it. I did drop it down a little bit later because you can see right here when I punched them out, there's quite a few threads of wood still hanging about and I want this to be, you know, totally clean. So the X1 comes with an enclosure and it has an intake fan and an extraction fan. I was using a super long hose to the window and it had a little bit of difficulty with actually extracting all of the fumes. They did mention that they were improving the extraction system for this model and they recommend putting it close to a window so that it actually does its job properly. Now the side plate over here is the most scary. This one is the largest of all the cuts. So I'm really curious how the machine holds up. But also if anything ever fails during this cutting process, then we essentially lose the entire board. I really wish there was something in Lightburn which you could use to tell it like, hey, start at 20% of the cut. That way you can actually recover from something failing. So what I appreciate most about this machine is its size, right? So they kept in mind the standard sheets of plywood that you can buy in a hardware store. And this is the medium model, so it accommodates 125 centimeters by 125 centimeters. So that's exactly the, the size that I usually work with. So at this point, I did run into some issues with the laser cutter itself. It was super hot, like 34 degrees Celsius in this apartment with all the video lights running and that kind of stuff. And the laser head started overheating. So it didn't shut down completely. It just shut down the laser beam and the head kept moving. That means it's skipping parts of the laser cut, right? I have to go past that with a jigsaw. Now they actually told me beforehand that the water cooling unit was a little bit troublesome. They look like Fred Ripper coolers to me. Might be mistaken, but it's pretty funny how they put this thing together. For the final production unit though, they're changing this up so it has more cooling capacity. But in general, I hope they implement a software fix for this as well, where if the laser head overheats, it just pauses the entire laser cut and then continues when it's cooled down again. We'll be moving on to the side plate over here, and this one's kind of nifty. It's like 120 centimeters long. One of the 3D printed inserts, I hope to put a 3D scanner in there. And the top one might hold a drill or, you know, the patch panel for the power requirements and that kind of stuff. It does take quite a bit of trial and error to actually find the most optimal cutting settings. So eventually I landed on 450 millimeters per minute at 100% power. And that cut through it in a single pass without leaving too much charring. So most of the charring that you're seeing on the bottom side over here is superficial it's kind of like dust essentially 
Right, so next we'll be moving to the connecting pieces. We have this bottom plate, which isn't too special, but we'll have to make sure that we glue this in place before we glue the top panel in place. That would be something I forget doing. <laughs> and then we have this bottom plate, which actually has the holes for the casters already pre-cut in this so that we don't actually need to measure anything. You can just pop the caster on there, screw it in place, and that will speed up the entire workflow a lot. So that's kind of a negative and a positive in the same thing. Some people, they build stuff to kind of get outside of their own head and get in a flow state like myself. With a laser cutter like this, which does all of the work, that doesn't really happen anymore. You're not in that flow state. Inside the entire structure, we have this plate over here, and this is also like a structural thing, but this holds the flexi spot legs in place. So the motors can like flush mount into this segment. We have a little gap over there for the cable to run through. So the glue process for this is super simple as well. You basically hold two bolts in place and wipe the stick over at once and then fold it in on itself. You do have to make sure that you put the proper panels in place first and I do actually recommend doing a dry fit to actually see if everything cut properly. There's no mistakes in the thing that will you know, hamper the glue up process. So in the Compute Box build series, I already noticed that painting the support boxes black is a lot better than leaving them the same color as the work surface because there's no visual distinction between those two and I think this will help the entire setup look a lot more decent. Uh, with this one, I'm not too sure if I made the right choices because this thing is really thin. In this case, I decided to drop the laser speed down to 430 millimeters per minute. Same 100% power, single pass, and it came off really quite cleanly, so that was nice. You also note that I've already made the holes to actually connect the entire setup together and this main gap over here, which will put a 3D printed insert into, but it also allows the cables to you know, go through this body. So something I always do with laser cutters because they're quite dangerous for your eyes. I sit in a different room and I have a little security camera that's inside of the machine. We can check up on it. If something really bad happens and light burn doesn't work anymore, I can also switch off the power. For this project, we're still using 12 mm thick multiplex. If I had known how powerful this machine was actually going to be, I might have gone for 18mm thick multiplex because that has less tendency to bend and twist and the 12mm ones do have that a little bit. So especially for this thin piece over here, I was a little bit concerned that something would twist quite a lot and result in the entire work surface being a little bit off. For this work surface I'm just applying some lacquer and you can really see how the colours from the wood actually pop. So when it's all finished up, the lacquer has dried out, it does look a little bit rough. Like you can see the charred edges and maybe I sanded down a little bit too much to where you can see the glue layer. Uh, I've said it many times in my videos, I actually enjoy that look quite a lot. Especially when you put very high tech machinery on this thing, which looks super clean. You have that contrast and you kind of juxtapose the two. Next up is this bottom plate over here and this one's super simple. It holds the 3D printer and the laser cutter, but also has some gaps at the bottom. And these are so that we can actually access the bolts. But these are exactly the right size to put some spotlights in place. Now the cut for the bottom plate actually went really quite well. I did that in a single pass and everything was fine, but the cut for the top plate didn't go too well. It wasn't able to cut through it at certain points and had another overheating issue where it shut off from time to time. So I grabbed one of the other cuts, I put it on top of here and then marked out where we need to jigsaw out another piece and that worked out totally fine. So in this case, I'm not entirely sure what happened here, but I needed to use a Knipex wrench to actually break off the excess pieces. And I think I might have moved the laser head upwards a little bit, so it wasn't in focus properly. Something I'm leaving for a different episode is this top segment over here, which will hold the monitor. And Uperfect reached out a little while ago. I asked them if they wanted to send over a foldable version, and they did, so we'll have two monitors above each other. And I want to make sure that it's implemented properly. And yeah, we'll do that in the next episode see how this all comes together. Something else I learned on the Compute Box build series is that it's really nice to have some space between different components of the build. And so I'm cutting out some spaces over here which we'll put between you know, the side box and the middle work surface. And to fasten this all together, I'm using some M10 bolts which are 60 millimeters long. And I'll put some washers around it because the wood is really quite soft. So if we you know, tighten stuff down, it just eats into it. The reason I'm using washers and not just gluing this together is because I want this thing to be able to be taken apart. So if we move somewhere else, then it's really easy to just unbolt some stuff. In the first episode, I actually showed you these casters that I bought for the setup. These are usually underneath workbenches to keep the entire thing a little bit more stable. 
In this case, I wanted these underneath there because when the 3D printer is running, like at max speed, the setup usually tends to wobble quite a lot and I'd like to prevent that on this system. So because we 3D scanned the casters in the first episode and modeled out all the gaps, I don't actually need to measure anything at this phase, which saves quite a bit of time actually. It trickles down into the process more and more as you go along. So if we plan out stuff in the pre-production phase even more, I'm really wondering how much time we can save in the actual construction process. I was quite surprised by the casters, they roll really smoothly and I've had some trouble with casters in the past but these are really quite good. The, you know, the price also reflects that. And just to give me a better idea of what the setup would feel like eventually, I put the fabrication panel on here on the monitor arm, which is not the way that we'll be implementing it on the final version. I actually have some hinges that I want to implement and mount it onto the side. And now that's actually there, I have a better idea of how we're actually going to be doing that. So that's pretty awesome. After that I put all the machinery in place, uh, the Bamboo Lab X1C alongside the Xtool S1. And we also still need to attach the shelf brackets, so I didn't actually plan this out. Uh, my idea initially was to 3D scan these and then pre-drill the holes for it so this would be super easy. Once those were screwed in, I noticed that they're not really holding this air purification system all too well. So I had to drill a hole through this and add an extra strap to hold it in place. This wasn't necessarily part of the plan, but I was concepting this to look somewhat like one of those off-road vehicles with straps holding a bag in place. Yeah, I kind of like it. It's okay. Alright, so I hope you enjoyed episode 2. Definitely stay tuned for episode 3 where we'll probably be 3D printing the 3D printed inserts, doing some of the electrical work and hopefully, you know, making the top segment, implementing the monitor, that kind of stuff. I'm really excited for this one. I hope you are too. Have a good day. See you in the next episode.